Hello everybody, Resonance here with another Pokemon Ultra Sun Ultra Moon Wi-Fi Battle Analysis, which explains the strategy and thought process for each player. You can find links to more of these below, as well as many comprehensive, competitive tutorials. Thank you, as always, for the support. In this particular battle, I'll be showcasing a Mega Mawile Balance team, supported by a Chandelure and Tapu Fini. Let's jump into Team Preview. I start out every battle by breaking down the two teams, to compare our different strategies and figure out a way to dismantle them. My roster on the left is one of my favorite unconventional teams, since it's so flexible with its playstyle, and my opponent's party is very well built too. Mega Mawile will be my primary win condition, threatening to sweep a weakened team after boosting its attack with Swords Dance. To support it, I've got a defensive core of Tapu Fini, Ferrothorn, and Gudra. Tapu Fini's terrain ability will protect my Mawile from status effects for 5 turns. In addition, my Mawile and my Ferrothorn are excellent bait for fire moves, which trigger my Chandelure's Flash Fire ability. Once activated, Chandelure's next fire type attack that it uses will have 50% boosted power. This is tricky to plan around, but depending on the matchup, I can use this to snag some unexpected KOs. Prodont is also my speed control and alternate win condition. It carries Aqua Jet, which always goes first, in case my opponent threatens a sweep. My opponent's roster is another Mega Sableye team, but this one is very different than the previous battle, which I also recommend that you watch after this. The two battles showcase radically different ways to play around this common threat. Mega Sableye is a wall that knocks off held items, spreads burns, and basically never dies unless your opponent gets creative. There are so many threats here, one of which is definitely Magnezone, which prevents Steel types from being switched out, such as my Ferrothorn. I also have to watch out for Garchomp's Swords Dance and Cloyster's Shell Smash, both of which can easily sweep my team with their boosted stats. Going into this match, I knew it would be one of the most intense, skill-testing battles that I would have. I start off by making the bold play of leading with my Mawile on the predicted Garchomp lead. He does indeed lead with Garchomp, and I manage to get the Intimidate off on it to cut its attack stat, but I am threatened out. I think Garchomp was a good lead. I was actually hoping to catch Sableye. Now that I've cut its attack stat with Intimidate, I know I can safely switch into Ferrothorn on the predicted Earthquake. That was a great play on my opponent's part, since my team notably lacks a ground immunity, and instead has to rely on strong predictions to pick off opposing ground types. Seeing how little damage my Ferrothorn takes, I know that he's going to switch out, so this is a free Stealth Rocks for me. He withdraws his Garchomp and goes into Sableye, trying to get it out as soon as possible, so that way he can Mega Evolve to get the Magic Bounce ability. Mega Sableye is usually a strong anti-lead, since its ability reflects back status moves, including things like Stealth Rocks, Leech Seed, and Toxin. For reference, Stealth Rocks deals a bit of Rock-type damage to Pokémon on entry. I now withdraw into my Mawile again, on the predicted knockoff, while he Mega Evolves. I know that Mega Stone held items cannot be knocked off, and with the Intimidate, I take even less damage. My Mawile now threatens to Mega Evolve, and go for the Fairy-type Play Rough, the only type that Sableye is weak to. But here's the twist. I don't actually Mega Evolve, and instead, I switch out yet again. This was all an elaborate bait. I go out into Chandelure on the predicted Will-O-Wisp, which triggers my Flash Fire ability. My next Fire-type attack will now have 50% increased base power. On turn 6, I now go for the Z Fire attack, Inferno Overdrive, to net a surprise KO on the Mega Sableye from 100% HP, he did not know that I had the Fire Z Crystal, and was definitely not expecting it. Chandeliers run all sorts of sets, but this time I gave mine a Fire Z Crystal for the Flash Fire Synergy, just so that I could break through walls like Mega Sableye. I've got a team very weak to Will-O-Wisp, so this felt like the perfect tech, and man am I happy with how this turned out. Calcifer is one of my favorite Pokémon, and there are a few things more satisfying than setting up an elaborate prediction. Okay, so let's rewind for a second. How exactly did I set this up in the first place? Since Team Preview, I knew the only way that I could KO Mega Sableye is with an unexpected Flash Fire boost. So in order to bait that, I had to use Mawile as a lure. He knows it's my primary win condition, so throwing out a Will-O-Wisp burn is just too tempting. He'd win the game on the spot if I let that happen. This actually required me to play very creatively, since I had to not actually let Mawile get burned while simultaneously presenting the opportunity. That's also why I did lead with Mawile, 
hoping that Sableye would be his choice, but also knowing that I could use it as an Intimidate pivot to try and bait it out again if need be. At the start of the battle, I never once sent out Tapu Fini, even though I would have loved to set up Misty Terrain, just because the terrain would prevent my opponent from using Will-O-Wisp. I also kept pivoting between Ferrothorn and Mawile just to bait that burn. What's extra crazy about this series of plays is that I actually haven't used any of Mawile's attacks. I haven't even Mega Evolved. It's just there to be the bait in this specific matchup. In competitive Pokemon, you have to adapt to your opponent's team and sometimes make unorthodox trades just to get the upper hand. And in my Pokemon Wi-Fi Battle Analysis series, I really try to showcase that. Well, that was a trip, and I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. Back to turn 7. Since Sableye fainted last turn, he now sends out Tapu Lele for free. Lele's ability summons Psychic Terrain for 5 turns, making priority moves like Aqua Jet fail, as well as increasing the damage of Psychic-type attacks. The terrain boost will force me out, which is a good play. In response, I switch out into Ferrothorn, correctly predicting a Psychic or Psyshock. He does go for Psychic because it does the most damage to Chandelure. I think that was a strong choice because it still did a ton to Zyra, like almost 50%, and he can't risk a Focus Blast if I stay in, since Chandelure is immune. It's turn 8, and he withdraws into Magnezone to trap my Ferrothorn with his Magnet Pull ability. Meanwhile, I go for Protect, to scout if his Lele is carrying a Choice Item or not. Choice Items boost one of your stats, but prevent you from using different attacks until you switch out. And both Choice Specs and Choice Scarf are common items for Lele. If he's not choiced, then I'd expect him to stay in and use Focus Blast. But since he switched, I now know that he is locked into using Psychic. This is quite valuable information, and I was prepared to lose my Ferrothorn just to learn more about his team. He makes a fantastic play by trapping me here. I cannot switch out, so his Magnezone's Hidden Power Fire nets a free KO. That's why they run this move. This was excellent for him, and shows that he is very much still in the game. I still have to pick off Lele, Cloyster, and Garchomp, but now I know much more about this Lele set. On turn 10, I send out Chandelure to threaten out Magnezone. He responds by switching his Magnezone out into Garchomp, predicting my Fire-type attack. Recognizing that the Fire attack is too obvious, I go for Shadow Ball instead, predicting his switch. Shadow Ball won't KO Magnezone, but I know that he's not staying in, and Shadow Ball does way more damage to everything else especially this Garchomp that I have to KO. So we've got a weakened Garchomp versus Chandelure. I can't stay in here, so I was drawn to a Spella to set up Misty Terrain and avoid a potential Outrage, which I'm immune to. He goes for Earthquake instead, which is another excellent play. It's far safer, and I take a ton of damage from it, like 50%. This is one of the reasons why my Phenia has the Leftovers Held item, as well as significant HP investment. Thankfully, I never gave him an opportunity to set up Stealth Rocks with either Garchomp or Clefable. My opponent now goes for Earthquake yet again, trying to secure a KO, but I've been in this situation before, so I have a good idea of how much Earthquake will do. After Leftovers Recovery, and if my opponent does not have Stealth Rocks, I should live this. And I barely do, thanks to Leftovers. My Feeny is now able to finish him off with Moonblast, since I went for Shadow Ball earlier, that's one more threat down, but the battle is far from over. The third phase of the raid boss begins. Cloyster is sent out, but it gets chunked by my Stealth Rocks. Cloyster is usually a devastating Shell Smash sweeper, so instead of making the obvious play and switching out, I actually taunt him on the predicted Shell Smash. My taunt makes his Shell Smash fail, and locks him into only using attacking moves for the next three turns. Looping back for a moment, Let's quickly review how I caught this Cloyster. It required quite a bit of strategic planning, like way back in the start of the match, and recognized that Ferrothorn's one goal would be to somehow set up Stealth Rocks before Sableye Mega Evolved, and before Magnezone trapped it. If I could get up Stealth Rocks, which I did on turn 3 by pivoting with Mawile, then I can guarantee that Cloyster takes some solid damage on entry. Why did I need that chip damage so badly? It's going to put Cloyster in range of Moonblast, which I don't think he expected. Also, Cloyster is a huge offensive threat, so I had to plan that far ahead to make sure that I didn't get swept later. Back to turn 14, Cloyster is taunted and must attack or switch out. With that in mind, I go for Moonblast, knowing that I'm faster since the Shell Smash failed. 
I managed to successfully KO the Cloister before it gets to do anything at all, because I predicted him with Taunt, and I got my Stealth Rocks on turn 3. This was a huge relief, and very difficult to set up. Now that the Cloister has fainted, the final threat remains. Tapu Lele comes out. As a result, my Misty Terrain is replaced by his Psychic Terrain, and he goes for Psy Shock to finish off my Tapu Fini. While I could have predicted that, I remembered that his Lele was Choice Lock, so I needed to sack Fini to scout what move he would lock himself into. On turn 16, I now send out Crawdont, since Dark types are immune to Psychic attacks. While I cannot Aqua Jet him because the Psychic Terrain blocks priority moves, I still threaten him out, since he cannot change attacks due to that Choice item we talked about earlier. Knowing that he has to withdraw, I go for Dragon Dance on the predicted switch. He sends out Clefable on my predicted knockoff, which was a great play. I was hoping for Magnazone, since I need a boost to take it down, but I knew that this line of play was fine for me too. Clefable was definitely a smart choice. I made the decision to switch out, knowing that Clefable is super bulky, and could have the unaware ability, making it ignore stat changes. I just don't want to trade Crawdont for Clefable, since having a dark type is useful against Lele. I go into Chandelure on the predicted Moonblast, and I get it right. Thankfully, I take very little damage from the resisted Moonblast. I started the match by playing very defensively to lure the Mega Sableye, and now I'm constantly putting my opponent's Pokémon in check to isolate each individual threat to my team. Next, he withdraws Clefable into Magnezone, recognizing that most Clefables can't really touch Chandelure. Meanwhile, I have Calcifer go for Flamethrower. Magnezone is knocked out as it switches in. I went for Flamethrower instead of Shadow Ball, because I expected the Magnezone here. I think he had to take that risk though, so it was certainly worth a shot. Tapu Lele comes out and goes for Moonblast, on my predicted switch into Crawdon, which I think was a fine play. He also thinks that I'm not likely to stay in, since he knows that I know that he's faster. But I do stay in, thinking that he might overpredict since he's cornered and forced to make risky plays. I finally KO his Lele with a Shadow Ball. If he went for Psychic or Psyshock, then I would have lost Chandelure, but I was fine with that if it meant inviting in Crawdont next turn. His last Pokemon with Fable is sent out, and my opponent concedes on turn 20. That's why the battle replay just cuts off. We end it 4-1. to one. The concede was totally fair, as there was no way he could win at that point. My opponent is a very skilled battler, and I only happen to get the better of him this time with some insane hard reads. It happens to everyone, and sometimes the dynamic is completely reversed. While this battle was rather quick, I don't select battles based off how long they are, but rather if either me or my opponent make some really interesting plays, and this is easily one of my favorite strategic battles. I also post battles based off the teams, in case I want to showcase a specific Pokémon. This battle may have been shorter, but it was quite close, and very, very unique. It was bound to happen eventually, but this time, I didn't use Gudra at all, and my Mega Mawile never fired off a single attack. Every battle in Pokemon is like a different puzzle to solve. In this case, I didn't need Gudra at all, unless things went south, and the best way I could use Mawile was actually as bait. I was also prepared to sack my Ferrothorn and my Feeny if need be, just to scout his team. Overall, I absolutely adore this battle. It's not indicative of how good my opponent actually is, but rather, it's just a great example of why I love Pokémon so much. I had to play this match in a very creative way just to stand a chance. Sometimes the stars align and your creative strategies work, and those are the best moments. To me, competitive Pokémon is the perfect outlet to express myself, and I hope that my battle analysis series and tutorials inspire some of you to either keep watching more or even try out the games. There is so much to explore in the world of Pokémon, and I want to share that wonder with everyone. I really hope that everyone enjoyed this Wi-Fi battle analysis. If you found it useful, then please do let me know in the comments below. I'm always interested in your feedback and hearing what types of videos you'd like to see from me next. You can find links to more Wi-Fi battles in the video description and at the end of the video. There are also plenty of Pokemon tutorials on my channel, more to come, and as always, your support means a lot to me. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time. GG, well played!